want to welcome you today to uh, the COIL talk. The main focus is going to be on entrepreneurship. We've, we've changed the schedule around a little bit in terms of, of what was on the, the site. We're actually going to start with Invent Penn State, and James Delatry is going to get up and talk a little bit first. The Invent Penn State initiative was started in 2015 by Dr. Barron. The focus was a, is a, it's, a, it's an initiative that's focused on a Commonwealth-wide effort to spur economic development, job creation, and student career success. And James is going to talk about that and, and the opportunities that are get, being presented uh, through Invent Penn State. I'll then talk a little bit about the EdTech Network, which is actually a vertical within Invent Penn State and our focus around EdTech technology and how we're helping to do some of the same things in support of the Invent Penn State mission, spurring economic development, as well as looking at how we can help transform technology and uh, create um, advanced capabilities for World Campus. We may take a little Q&A after those two, um, and then the star of today's event is going to be uh, Andrew Ackerman, Ackerman from, from Dream It. And he's going to deep dive a little bit on if you do have an idea, how can you validate that idea by getting out there early and talking to the customer. And he's got some real world experience and, and some great advice that he's going to bring to the table. And, and, uh, we'll, and we'll talk a little bit about that when he gets, uh, uh, gets here. So no further ado, I'll introduce James and let him tell you a little bit about himself. Thank you, Darren. Uh, so uh, by show of hands, who here has heard of Invent Penn State prior to today? All right, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, who here has uh, ever been part of a startup company? Anyone here ever been part of a startup company? One back there. Great. All right. Couldn't wait to get to academia, back to academia, it's good. Uh, and then who um, has worked on a technology where you've at one point said, you know, there could be a startup company in here, there could be a way to take this to market. Is, is that kind of folks in the room that have had that thought? Okay, that, great. I'm just trying to get a sense of, of kind of the, the backgrounds here. Um, so um, as Darren said, uh, I'm James Delatry. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Research and the director of the new Office for Entrepreneurship and Commercialization in the research office here at Penn State. Uh, my background, uh, I did my undergrad at Penn State, um, did my graduate work in chemistry at UC Berkeley and worked in Silicon Valley for a while. Uh, ended up working overseas for a couple years and then came back to Penn State to join a startup company that focused on nanomaterials manufacturing. And so I grew that company for a number of years, shrunk that company for a number of years, grew it again, and, and uh, so forth you know, the kind of trials and tribulations of a startup company, but had an opportunity to come to the university a couple of years ago as President Barron uh, came into the university and was, was looking to really ramp up this area of entrepreneurship support. And uh, Darren did a very good job of describing it, but there was a, a very clear focus that uh, came with President Barron uh, on um, kind of embracing uh, entrepreneurship and startups and taking our innovations and getting them into the market for positive societal impact, now th that's a part of the land-grant mission as, as we think about it. It's not how we've traditionally thought about the land-grant mission, but taking all the great things that come out of the university and actually getting them into the market where they can be impactful is, is indeed uh, part of, of uh, what, what uh, was envisioned with land grants. And, and uh, so uh, we're ramping that up through a series of initiatives. And so there are four basic pillars under Invent Penn State. Uh, the first, um, transforming Penn State's uh, capacity uh, or uh, Penn State's uh, ability to promote economic development. That's really about culture change. Um, and so the idea is, you know, with, with uh, regularity, we will uh, be excellent in teaching. With regularity, we'll be excellent with our publications or research. And the idea is, uh, over time, to make it as comfortable and, and as, as uh, common for a student, faculty member, staff member that has a, a technology that could be impactful, take that to market with, with uh, just the same level of comfort as we do publish and, and teach and, and the other areas where, where we're excellent. Um, and so there are a series of, initi uh, of initiatives under that, and I'll, I'll give some examples. Um, increasing our capacity to develop startups. Um, and uh, um, also to attract companies into the area. Um, so there are a couple of, of um, components to that. One is, is kind of infrastructure, you know, physical places where entrepreneurs can assemble, 
can test ideas, um, where they can uh, deep dive on their projects. That's, that's one of the components. And I'll talk a little bit about some innovation hubs that the university has stood up across the, uh, the Commonwealth, focused specifically on that. But it's also training, it's also funding. Those are all required to successfully help the great ideas that are boiling up inside of the university translate out into the world. Uh, so I'll spend less time on the, on the uh, lower two bullets, but I will do a, a plug for uh, the Invent Penn State Venture and IP Conference, which kicks off tomorrow uh, at the Penn Stater. It's a two-day event. Um, the registration uh, was capped uh, last night because we hit our max capacity, 550 people, about 70 venture capitalists from across the country, uh, about 100 startup companies, and uh, all kinds of uh, folks that are uh, in this space of, of uh, startups, uh, education, economic development. So a great event, and I think uh, most of all, there's a whole portion where folks will have an opportunity to see some of the fantastic things that are very early stage at Penn State, but given a little bit of time, they could make a real uh, impact on society. Um, and uh, the uh, strong path to student career success, um, there are a bunch of uh, initiatives, most of them in the academic colleges that already support this. A number more coming online, but you know, for, for sake of time, I won't get too deep into that today. But overall, 20 plus initiatives, uh, looks like it's gonna be uh, on virtually every single campus about a year from now, which is fantastic. So um, who we are, it's a distributed team of folks that are guiding the initiative uh, from outreach to uh, the Office of the Vice President for Research, Ben Franklin Technology Partners, uh, which is an, uh, a uh, local economic development organization that's funded by the state of Pennsylvania. They have offices in Innovation Park. I'll talk more about them later. Um, nice distributed team. Probably the most important person here is actually uh, Nina Ellis Koshny. She's the communications director. And so she does a wonderful job of taking stories that we have inside of the university and amplifying them uh, in a way that either gets interest from a potential partner, from students that may want to participate in a project. So she's uh, someone to, to take note of. And you'll probably see, with increasing regularity, news articles coming out uh, that are um, uh, written by Nina. So uh, one of the first initiatives of Invent Penn State, and, and this really addresses the, the need uh, to put funding behind the, the, the uh, translation of ideas out of the lab into the marketplace, uh, is, is the Fund for Innovation. And so uh, to date, $2.7 million in commercialization grants have been distributed uh, across seven colleges. Now that's uh, $2 from the college for every $1 that comes from the Penn State Research Foundation which is the group that uh, the subsidiary of Penn, of, uh, of Penn State that manages the intellectual property of the university. Um, but uh, it's $2.7 million and $75,000 uh, block grants that focus very specifically on taking a technology or, or innovation and uh, allowing uh, either a postdoc or graduate student more or less a year to take that platform technology and make something that looks like a prototype that could be used to get some market feedback, which is really important, and Andrew will touch on that in depth today. So um, after the proof of concept part, there's a proof of relevance. And so that's a, um, a market study um, that uh, typically is, is uh, done by a collection of SMEAL MBAs um, that will say, OK, well, here's how we think this product would need to be positioned. Here's what the price structure needs to be. Here, this might be the first uh, vertical you go after. Sometimes there are fundamental questions of, of business model, right? To, to start as a freemium model and then it flips to a subscription, is it ad-based revenue? Matters, uh, you know, all those things are important. Um, and that's some of the information that uh, is, is gathered by the SMEAL MBAs. Um, five new startups in the last year have been formed out of this program, which is fantastic. Um, and then, um, so that the Block grants aren't always tied to a college. Starting next year, we'll have an additional 10 grants that are funded um, out of philanthropic dollars that could go to any student, faculty, staff member in the university with a great idea. So it's going to uh, kind of open up this program to anyone inside of the Penn State system, uh, which I think is, is uh, well needed. It's, it's been great to have this uh, you know, initial support of, 
of a limited number of colleges, but the, the breadth of the university I think requires us to open this up more and so we'll be able to use some philanthropic dollars in the coming year to expand the program. Uh, one resource that's been around um, since before there was a President Barron or Penn State uh, is the, the Ben Franklin Tech Accelerator Program. And uh, if any of you, uh, has anyone ever heard of Tech Accelerator? Familiar? Uh, so uh, the Ben Franklin Technology Partners, three times a year, run a 10-week boot camp where any community member, faculty, staff member with a business idea, uh, if you're selected, uh, you'll work with them over 10 weeks and very methodically walk through customer discovery process. They've got a team of professional market researchers that will go and dig out key information that would help you position your product, find out who the competitors are, um, and then uh, ultimately really help you uh, define what the important features are of your technology, but then also coach you on, on how to pitch, you know, how to stand and deliver, how to hit the value proposition so that um, when you're talking to someone, it's not our, our typical mode, which is we're very comfortable talking to our peers in our technical language, right? But talking to someone who's not from our, our technical area can sometimes be a challenge. And so this is a 10-week program that helps folks uh, build uh, kind of a, 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 an external vernacular uh, that works in a startup world. Uh, so uh, in the last year and a half, a number of the Fund for Innovation awardees elected to go straight into Tech Accelerator, and so you can see this kind of contiguous pathway that comes together where there's the researcher has an idea, then there's funding that helps them move that along into their proof of concept prototype, then you go into this training uh, uh, session over 10 weeks, and it's the stepwise evolution, and that's, that's the idea here is to build this contiguous support pathway to help folks. Um, running parallel to Tech Accelerator, we have a new program called the Happy Valley Launch Box. And this is an 8,000 square foot building in downtown State College um, that is dedicated to supporting startup companies. It also runs three 10-week uh, boot camps uh, focused on customer discovery, uh, lean startup principles or the, the ideas that underpin it. And similarly, they help you move through customer discovery. How do I position my product? What are the key things I need to know to move my business ahead? This has the added element of its 24-7 office space in the downtown State College, and it's co-located with Penn State's Small Business Development Center, which has skill building courses like QuickBooks training or how do I run a cash flow in a company. So there's the services that are there. There's also an intellectual property clinic that, would, uh, that helps at no cost. That's right, lawyers at no cost are available there um, that will help you um, find out what's the right mode for me to protect my idea and what's the balance in between talking to someone so I can find out that my idea is valid but being protective so I don't disclose something that would put me at a competitive disadvantage. So um, there's the IP clinic and then there's uh, an entrepreneurial assistance clinic that helps with all other uh, legal matters. So you know, do I have an agreement between my co-founders that uh, you know, prevents uh, a Zuckerberg, Winklevoss, twins situation down the road, right? That, not that that happens very frequently, but um, in fact, we had an undergraduate startup uh, team a year and a half ago that was doing extremely well, got angel investment to help them start their company, and as soon as the money came in, they realized that they had just made an agreement on the back of a napkin, and they had different ideas how that, uh, that, that agreement was going to be executed, and the, the napkin got lost. So uh, that's an example of, of, of by not having those legal foundations, the company ended up evaporating and it was a great idea and had some traction. So the Entrepreneurship Assistance Clinic is designed to help early stage companies address those issues in advance so that uh, the, uh, the companies don't sink before they uh, um, really can have a chance to succeed. Uh, so that's all available at Happy Valley Launchbox. Um, the 10-week boot camp, we've had 120 applications, and it's only been open since April. Uh, so uh, the, it's rolling applications, so you could apply at any time if you're interested. And if you just want to stop in from 9 to 5, it's open. There's a help desk there. You can get more information about the program. You can sit with Lee Erickson, the program director, and she'll tell you kind of next-level detail about the program. 
So uh, that's just in State College. I know there are folks from, uh, from a number of uh, uh, campuses on the, uh, uh, on the uh, virtual meeting today. Really excited about the fact that there are 13 total innovation hubs that have been funded out of this same program. Um, all of them are different because they're all designed to reflect the needs of their community. So as an example, Abington is um, a fantastic arts community. And so they've taken their launch box, Abington launch box, and they've nested it inside of an art museum that also has a fiber maker space. So folks can go there and do prototyping and uh, develop kind of a, a, a low fidelity uh, uh, designs that could get feedback, but it's done in an environment that's very organic for, for that community. So there's another maker space up in Erie. There's a co-working space opening in New Kensington. Um, they're all different, um, but, but uh, it's going to be a great collection of resources when they're all up and online. Um, they're all in various stages of implementation right now. Uh, the Lehigh Valley launch box uh, is, has been up the longest and is doing uh, incredible work already. Uh, so this is all part of driving economic development, putting resources in the community that can be transformative. And the other thing that's happened, and this has been a byproduct, but it's awesome, is that we've had a ton of visibility uh, in the press most recently. And uh, certainly this isn't you know, singularly attributed to Invent Penn State, but I think it's in recognition of a general groundswell in this space uh, across the university. So State College was named one, it was actually the 10th best place in the country to live and launch a new company. And that's because of the work-life balance that we have here in central Pennsylvania. So that's just an example of one of the fantastic uh, press clippings that's come out of, of this uh, initiative. So, uh, Last thing I wanted to talk about, um, just very briefly, is the conference. And, my intention when I put this slide in here yesterday was to invite you all to quick re register, but now the registration is capped, so we'll tell you about it, but I'm sure we're just gonna declare victory at the end, uh, but it, it, it should be really great. Like I said, a really nice cross-section of folks that are very interested in early stage technologies. The key thing I wanted to bring up though is this is not just a once and done, this is our inaugural. So we're anticipating about every 18 months having one of these conferences uh, I'm not sure that they'll all be in uh, State College. They may actually move to, um, to Philly and Pittsburgh or to Erie or even Harrisburg because there's so much activity in the Commonwealth campuses and the communities that are a little more densely populated. Uh, we're, we're not exactly sure what the next one's going to look like, but there will be ongoing opportunities to showcase the great inventions that are coming out of the university with a very elite group of, of uh, funders that are interested in this space. So. Um, that, that's all I had. Darren, do you want to uh, take it from here and then we'll do Q&A after? Yeah, let's do all that. Right, perfect. So I get, I get a lot of questions around what the EdTech Network is. Before I get into it, I'll just give you a brief background on myself. So I, I too went to Penn State. Uh, I graduated undergrad in engineering. I um, was working for a professor at the time and was on a project, a research project involving IBM and geographic information systems. Without giving my age away, that was 20 some years ago. But what we did, he actually, he left the university to start a company. He and I did it together. We um, secured uh, a resource from IBM that understood the technology. We were venture backed. So it, I have kind of this real world experience of what it was like to create a startup here in town. Um, it, it, caused me to get the entrepreneur bug right out of the gate. I decided after three years in this startup, I needed to go back and I needed to understand more about business. So I came back to SMEAL, got my MBA, got my a master's in engineering along the way just because they were willing to pay for it and uh, did a lot of, I created several companies over the years. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I spent the, about 12 years in Boston during the internet boom times, grew an internet consulting company there uh, long story short, uh, my family's around here. I grew up, around, I grew up an, hour, an hour outside of State College. So when we started having kids, it was time to move back to State College and be around the extended family. Uh, ended up talking with Craig Weideman a lot around what was happening with World Campus and, and the whole disruption of higher ed and where that's going. And it was decided the EdTech Network made a uh, sense in terms of how, to cre how do we create a vehicle where Penn State can start innovating around educational technology 
and finding innovators and creating an ecosystem for them. And this is how uh, the EdTech Network was born, as, a, as I, sa I said earlier, a vertical under Invent Penn State. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, just kind of it's like at a high level, what's EdTech about, and then some opportunities for, for people to get engaged. Right now we're focused on creating opportunities. It's really about collaboration. It's about bringing together different stakeholder groups so that we can begin looking at the uh, opportunities and, and issues, problems, challenges, et cetera, as a group. So we're bringing together ed tech companies, entrepreneurs, students, faculty, and staff. So let's, let's, let's be a facilitator of collaboration. That's a little off the chart for some reason. Um, but we're, we're also fostering the development of technology solutions. The idea there is that we're, we're looking for opportunities to transform education because there's a lot going on, there's a lot of disruption happening. But also, as we look at innovations, how can we incorporate some of those capabilities back into World Campus? And as you know, World Campus being a, a leader in online learning. We're also supporting economic development. And this is where we have really close ties from the standpoint of Invent Penn State. The concept here is if we can create if we can create a reason for companies to come here and innovate with us, then the ultimate goal is we end up creating a ed tech hub where there's, it's kind of like a petri dish of ideas floating around, new things being born, and we actually can create an innovation hub. I talk about bringing people together collaborate, in collaboration. These are the primary stakeholder groups, companies, entrepreneurs, students, faculty, and staff. So anytime we talk about an initiative, we always then challenge ourselves, well, how does this help these stakeholder groups? You can't just be focused on one. We have to look at all four. As we look at them, the opportunities for companies, number one, we, they can attend invitation-only events to come in and, and, and network with faculty, staff, researchers, share ideas, et cetera. The networking is really key for these ed tech companies. Engagement. Let's collaborate them, with them. Let's, let's break down the vendor relationship and let's truly create collaborative partnerships where we work with tech companies to create new solutions. Because what's happening, the innovation cycle is so fast now, if we keep following the typical vendor relationship, by the time we get a vendor in here, things have changed. So now we have to start focusing more on partnerships. There's opportunities to participate in pilot projects. We're looking at students as one of the greatest underutilized resources that we have. And we're saying, how can we link students with companies? An example would be hackathons. And we'll get into a, an initiative we have there in a little more detail in the next slide. Companies have the opportunity through these interactions to identify students for internships and employment. And then finally, participating in special programs. And I'll tell you a little bit about the Nittany Watson Challenge. Faculty and staff. Through these collaborations, you're going to find new opportunities for publications and research. Again, attending these events where we create collaboration opportunities. Funding for innovative research projects. We're looking at different avenues and how we can help position faculty for new research opportunities. Participation in programs. Again, collaborative programs that involve students, companies, local entrepreneurs. Connect with businesses and entrepreneurs in, in ed tech, whether it's looking at new technology in the classroom or online learning. And then finally, we're just creating networking opportunities for, for innovation-focused faculty and staff to come together. I know I'm going a little quickly here. I'm just trying to give you that high-level overview, and then we'll get into some specific programs. From the entrepreneur standpoint, and me as a serial, serial entrepreneur, I'm constantly looking at this and saying, how can we better connect Penn State with those entrepreneurs? Because Penn State has so many resources. And yet, I was in this community for five years before initiating discussions around how I might help in ed tech. And quite honestly, I felt disconnected. So I'm now looking at opportunities as how can we create closer connections with entrepreneurs. One of the big gaps we're recognizing is when you look at these startups, that, and a lot of ideas are coming from the student population, there's this gap that we now see that we need leaders. We need we need seasoned entrepreneurs that can look at an idea and help take that student startup, whether it's mentorship or take a leadership role in that company. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity that's, that's here now to connect entrepreneurs to what's happening with some of these ideas that are coming out. Again, networking is an opportunity for entrepreneurs. 
be involved in the community, create other ed tech industry connections. So an entrepreneur might connect with a big ed, te ed tech company that we're working with already. Learn about le the latest ed tech technologies out there and what opportunities. And then finally participating in this collaborative environment and potentially getting involved in, in helping define or, or help identify some new Penn State World Campus um, solutions. And then for students, again, for students, it's, it's the connect, it's, you know what, I, I find myself saying this all the time, it's about the connections, really. And if the EdTech Network can be that facilitator and make that connection, we've gone a long way. Um, so the connections, internships, mentoring, when I think of connections, I, I can't give you a better example right now than a company that we're partnering with, Dreamit. Dreamit is an accelerator out of Philadelphia, and we're working closely with them in connecting students with some, some of the uh, startups that are going through that accelerator. So we're actually exposing students with internships with these companies. So they're getting real world experience with actual startup companies and what that takes. And they're bringing that experience back to Penn State as part of our ecosystem. So that's a really good um, example of a, of a partnership and the connections that students can make and what they can learn from that partnership. So entre or students get a chance to work with other members of the network, again, form relationships with members of the university, and finally attend these events. So I felt it was important, even though it's a, this is, it's a little dry, right? But I often get asked, people ask me, well, me as a student, what, what can I do to be part of the network? Faculty, staff. So I'm hoping that this will help answer some of those questions. One thing I want to talk a little bit about is a program that we're working with on with Hack PSU and we're calling it the Hack PSU EdTech Challenge. Basically, Hack PSU has a brilliant student team that has put together a hackathon that occurs every fall and every spring. What they do is they spend 24 hours of creating these amazing, like you would be surprised what these students come up with in 24 hours, what they're able to create. The opportunity for companies, they can actually come in and sponsor an EdTech Challenge give that group of students a specific challenge around their technology, and then the students go off and, and get innovative around addressing that specific challenge. The companies that participate are amazed at what these students come out with. So for a small investment from a sponsorship standpoint, they get a ton of creative ideas. It's, 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 it's just one small example of how do we leverage the greatest asset we have here at Penn State, that being the students. The, just to give you a couple examples of companies that are participating, Instructure, which is the owner of Canvas, so they're coming and they're going to show the students their, their uh, roadmap of development and challenge the students to, to solve some of the problems or issues that they want to so solve. Think about it though. Students are the actual users of that technology. Who better than to develop a solution for you than the customer? So it's kind of an interesting dynamic. And IBM, we're working closely with IBM and figuring out how can Watson be a transformational technology and how we can, we can use that to um, really create some unique capabilities within uh, a world campus. They're going to come and present the students with a challenge as well in using Watson. We're also working on another program with IBM and we're calling it the Nittany Watson Challenge. And I'm going to talk briefly about that to give you an idea of how you might be able to get involved. What we're doing is bringing together students, faculty, staff, ed tech companies, and actually it doesn't have to be an ed tech company, it could be any company, that want to look at trying to solve a specific challenge using Watson. Let me give you an example. So one of the, one of the things that we're looking at as far as World Campus goes is the, uh, the idea of um, transfer credits. Transfer credits can create a pretty big challenge for us as we look at students coming in with existing credits and are we going to accept that and how are we going to do that. Well, one of the things we're going to look at as part of the Nittany Watson Challenge, we're going to see if we can get a team to focus on that specific issue and how do you use Watson to reach out to different databases and get smart about around, well, based on the data Watson is finding, which transfer credits can I accept and which can I not? And you actually get Watson to make recommendations to the people who have to make the final decision. And then Watson can get trained and can get better at kind of figuring that out for us. So it's an opportunity to figure out how we can scale. Um, 
So we created this challenge really to, to surface innovative ideas. I just gave you that one example. But what we're going to do is we're going to fund 10 different ideas uh, at 5K each just to develop a prototype using Watson. And then we're going to take the five of those ideas that are the, the, that are the best and fund them an additional 10K going into a Happy Valley launch box. We're thinking the summer of 2017. So they'll have the summer to work on that specific idea. We'll give that team some funding and maybe they'll come out of that with a startup idea that could end up into, in Dream It's Accelerator. So that's to give you an idea of how we're trying to also connect the dots between these programs. Outcome, we're going to just look at examples of what are the potential impact of Watson. It's such a new technology. Let's just get people thinking about it and say, well, what could be the impact? Two, maybe there'll be some new research identified. Because what I've found, the people that I've spoke with, when, when people get it, a light bulb goes off and says, oh my gosh, you mean Watson could do this? And then there, there's some, the ideas just start to generate. And, and then, again, I told you about the summer program um, for Happy Valley Launchbox. And this is just one final uh, kind of FYI. We're also going to be funding what's called a big idea contest. We're working in conjunction with Ben Franklin. And we're looking for big ideas around ed tech. The announcement's going to come out in the fall. I don't have the details. But if you check the uh, ed tech network website, edtechnetwork.psu.edu, you'll, you'll you'll uh, get in tune to what's going on and you'll learn more about that, that contest if you're interested. So I'm going to stop talking. I feel like I've talked too much. Um, do we, I, I see Andrew's here. We can hook Andrew up and, and, and go right into the dreaming discussion and we'll take questions after. And I'm going to let Andrew do a self-introduction. He'll do a better job than I am. Thanks. That's because I made you do it last time. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Andrew. I'm from Dream It. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Dream It, Dreamit is the third oldest accelerator in the world. It's uh, one of the top ten accelerators by any, wasn't ready for that yet, uh, by any, any count. And we were also one of the first accelerators to ever do a vertically focused accelerator program. And it happened to be EdTech back in 2010. We now work with both EdTech and digital health startups. We've worked with pretty much every startup you can think of, any type of startup, from food tech to fashion tech to fintech, you name it. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted Darren to go first, I wanted him to give you at a high level the things that Dreamit and Penn State, largely Penn State, with Dreamit's help, have been working on to create this full spectrum of innovation. From the very beginning, even before you have an idea, till after you're out there and you're raising VC funding, we've really been talking about doing everything. And this is just a small taste of it. There is a lot that is not yet released, so you know, stay tuned. What I'm going to do is something entirely different. I'm going to take you deep into the program and give you a little taste of what goes on in our accelerator program and how we help startups become successful. Just so I know who I'm talking to, how many people here have a startup that they're working on right now? How many people here are thinking about doing a startup? Okay, we're getting there. Uh, the rest of you guys are in the wrong room because this is the only deck I have ready to go. Oh, okay, hi. Sorry about that. I was warned. So. We call this getting feedback early, and, and like all good presentations, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'll tell you, and then I'll tell you it at the end. Sorry, it's a good pedagogical tool, and we're in ed tech, so we do that. So number one, uh, we're going to tell you how to master the customer meeting. You know, when do you meet? Who do you meet? Where do you meet? What do you ask, and how do you ask it? And how do you make that discussion work so you get the most out of it? So when do you talk to customers is a question I get quite a bit. Usually, the person answering it is already too late. Well, it's never too late, but he should have done it earlier. You want to talk to a customer at the very earliest point possible because what you learn from that meeting will save you hours, months, maybe even years of your life. Now, you do not need a working product to talk to customers. You often don't even need a prototype. Sometimes you don't even need a piece of paper with your idea on it. You need just enough of, of the heart of the idea, the crux of the idea, what it solves, how it solves it, how it's better than what exists out there to put in front of customers and get their feedback on it. Prototype, not necessary mock-up, not necessary, not even minimal viable product. Now, there are situations when that doesn't fly. 
I'm going to be honest. If you're in a, uh, like a fashion industry where gloss matters, you can't go out with something half-baked. So you really do have to make really, really snazzy-looking mock-ups at the very least. But by and large, you can go to market, or at least to customers, with things that will blow your mind in terms of their simplicity. OK, so when you're talking about customers, it's important to think, keep in mind that your customer may not be one person. There is the person who benefits from it. There is the person who makes the decision to buy it. And there's a the person who actually writes the check. And in many cases, those could be three entirely different people. In fact, in ed tech, it often is. Often the student benefits. You might have a decision being made by a faculty member, but it's being paid out of a different budget. And in health tech, it's even more complicated, believe me. So when you're going into the meeting, you want to be prepared. You're never going cold, obviously. But what do you want to do to prepare for it? So number one, you want to go in there and you turn to, so Darren, I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. Uh, we're going to cover, I want to tell you about my product, which we talked about briefly over the phone. Uh, I want to get your feedback on, am I on the right track? Uh, what else should I be considering? Make sure he knows what the meeting's about. Could have been booked weeks ago and he might have entirely forgotten. Number two, uh, you want to structure these things almost as experiments behind the scenes. Right? You want to know what you're getting out of this. Like, this is the pain point I'm addressing. Does it really matter? Right? It should be a yes, no type hypothesis. Because the last thing you want is to come out of 45 minutes of meeting and still not know the answer, or still not have at least that one data point. And as you go in there, it could be just you, but if it's more than just you, if you're bringing a teammate in, be very clear on your roles. Right? You don't want to talk over each other. One guy will talk primarily about the product, and if you need somebody else to talk about tech, if that comes up, that's fine. And the last thing I want to point out is you got to know your audience. Right? Know exactly who they are, where they fit in the organization, what their role is, are they a decider, are they an influencer? And one of the best ways to do this, I think, is with an app called Charlie. Now, Charlie is a dream of company, so I'm talking my book here. What it does is it scans social media to find all the information it can find about the person you're about to talk to, from their Twitter profile to their LinkedIn profile, uh, and it will then merge it into your calendar. So in your calendar, there'll actually be a briefing or a link to a briefing on the person you're about to meet saves you hours of time. You don't have to use it. You can do it the hard way. But you want to know who you're talking to. During the meeting, Darren, we have about 45 minutes, right? OK, the reason you do that is if he thinks you have 20 minutes, you're not going to get everything done. You've got to adjust. All right, make sure we're on the right page with that as well. Uh, Darren, Jeff introduced us, right? Good, because if he didn't, you may have no idea why they're talking past each other. Plus, also, it establishes a little bit of rapport. That's the person you have in common. It also take, it's also worth taking a, a little bit of time just to make sure that the assumptions you've made about the person you're meeting are accurate. Like some, You may think that you're meeting someone who has a very technical grasp of the problem you're solving. But if you don't confirm it, you may end up jumping in with a very technically focused pitch, and it's going way over his head, because that's just not who he is. So you don't come out and say, you a PhD or not. Right, that's a little not smooth way to do it. But you should get a sense of, so you know, if I remember correctly, uh, you, you, know, you got your PhD at Purdue. I was, no, that wasn't me. That was somebody else. Oh, my mistake. I wonder who I was thinking. Where did you go to school, if you don't mind my asking? Just make it part of the whole social intro into the event, but get a sense of, kind of where they are in terms of technical sophistication, uh, maybe get a sense of what they've done before. It'll give you a sense of where they're coming from, what experiences they bring to the table, even how they view certain problems. And you can even go into what their roles and responsibility at the companies are. So I, I understand that you're um, well, your entrepreneur in residence, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go, good, I got it right. So I understand you're entrepreneur in residence. I know that means slightly different things at different funds. Um, what does that mean in the context of Penn State? Right, so it, gives, it also gives the person you're talking to a little bit of time to talk about themselves, which is always a plus. It always makes the fun, it always makes the, uh, the experience more fun for them if they get to talk about themselves. But it also helps you understand where they fit in. Are they a person who makes a decision? Are they on the committee that advises the person that makes the decision? Are they entirely spectators in the process? In which case, you may have chosen the wrong person to meet with. 
Uh, and then this is, this is actually one of the most critical things you have to get out here, so don't forget it. Make it clear that they can't hurt your feelings. I want you to be brutally honest with me. It's an idea. I haven't put a whole lot of time into it yet. If I'm wrong, you will save me years of my life, so please be brutally honest with me. And it's important that you say that because most people are nicer than I am. They don't want to hurt your feelings. They will sugarcoat it. Right? I mean, I won't because whatever, I do this for a living and I'm not a nice person. But most people, whether they mean to or not, will take it down a couple of notches. This gives them permission to say exactly what they mean. So don't forget to do it. Now, I said that the only thing you really need, am I making your life crazy by, by walking around? OK, fine. Uh, it helps, otherwise the energy comes out somewhere else. So the other thing that you, uh, sorry, I said that you don't really need a, uh, an MVP or mock-ups. The bare minimum you need is a positioning statement, which is kind of like your elevator pitch. But it's, it's actually pretty simple. Anyone here remember Mad Libs when they were growing up? So you know, Mad Libs are, you know, word, 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 insert something here, more words, insert something here. And usually the idea there was to be funny. Here the idea is to be, to be very clear about what you do. So the Mad Lib version of your positioning statement is for this particular target customer segment, and you want to be very specific, right? not universities, right? That's, that's almost meaningless in terms of a, of a, customer, say, a customer segment. For student affairs departments, for financial aid departments, you've got to get really granular on this. Or it could be for four-year universities, right? Because it may not apply to two-year community colleges. Really granular. So for target customer, who, and then you know, statement of need and opportunity, the pain point, who are struggling to reduce uh, you know, dropouts, for instance. Uh, the product, meaning what I'm doing, uh, is a, and again, what I'm doing, that, and here's the key benefits, that reduces your dropout rate by 10%. Very, very specific benefit, not airy and light and like improves, you know, I don't know, improves the atmosphere on campus. I mean, that's way too airy, right? Be really, really specific. Unlike, and this is where you get to kind of draw the line between you and the other people that they're probably already thinking of. So unlike competitor A and competitor B, uh, who can't do X, Y, and Z, right? So what makes you more better? What makes you special? What makes your solution the answer to all their prayers? So it'll be a little bit artificial the first couple of times you go through it. But as you continue to do it, you'll get pretty smooth at it. And you'll find that within 20 or 30 seconds, you can lay out the essence of what your company does and what makes it different and special and better than the competition. So this is what you need to go into the meeting. And this is what you should go into the moment you're past that intro phase of the meeting. All right, uh, we covered all that. So the next question, I said I was going to tell you where to meet. So the answer to where to meet is as much as possible at your customer's natural inhabitant, uh, environment. So why is that? So number one, you're more likely to get the meeting if you go to them. Right? It's just more convenient for them. Right? Number two, uh, observing them in their network. If they're in their own like, home field, they're going to be more comfortable, more likely to be candid with you, which always helps quite a bit. And if they need someone else to participate, they can just pull them in. Right? If maybe you got the wrong person, or maybe you got the right person, which is like, you know, I always lean on this guy for advice about whatever the topic is. Let me go see if he's at the desk. Obviously, he can't do that if he's you know, driven 20 miles to come to visit you. Also, it gives you an opportunity to see things you would not otherwise see. Right? Things about their workflow. Like, let's say what you're doing has to do with the shop floor. Being able to see people bending over, lifting packets up without weight belts, right? Or almost get run over by, you know, by pallets. Right? That tells you something about a work environment you can't get without seeing. Uh, also, sometimes you get to see really interesting things on the people's desks that they forgot to clean up before you got there. Like maybe a, an RFP that they're going to send out to one of your competitors. So you don't get that if you're at home. Uh, and also there's other things. The, the, you know, as much as doing things remotely is, is easier, uh, as much as more convenient, and as much as it's almost as good in many ways as being there, actually seeing somebody is the highest resolution form of, of communication. 
So being able to catch the body language, the nonverbals, it tells you a lot. And these are things that you will miss even in a teleconference. So the best is always in their office. Great. So uh, this is going to sound to some of you maybe very, very simple. But the truth is it's very, very powerful because I see people skip this all the time and they end up talking past each other and they don't get what they need out of it. You want to confirm that there is actually a problem. Just because you think it's a problem does not mean it's universally, uh, universally held and doesn't mean everyone thinks it's as painful. In fact, I'd venture to say most entrepreneurs think the problem is massive and frequent and everyone, everyone experiences it. And more often than not, they are wrong by some degree. Right, so you always want to confirm. So when I say how painful it is, right, there are things that are mildly annoying. It takes me five minutes out of my day to, to work around. If that's what it is, if that's what your customers are telling you, you're not in a good place. You don't want to solve minor annoyances. You want to solve massively painful problems. But what's more, you want to know how frequently it happens. So picking the right college is a massively painful problem. But it happens once in a lifetime. So companies that are attacking that particular problem, well, eh, good and bad, right? They get one shot at the apple per customer, hopefully. Right? Really what you want is something that happens over and over again. Every month I have to deal with X, and it's a huge pain in the butt. Also, you want to know how they deal with it today, right? A lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs will come to me and say, oh, we have no competition. Well, that's not true first. Well, it's very cute that you say that. We hear that a lot, but it's not true. Right? You may not have any competition that you know of, but the problem just doesn't go away. People are doing something to deal with it. It may be as inelegant as post-it notes. It may be as inelegant as walking somewhere to pick something up. But somehow they deal with that problem. You want to know what that baseline is. And you get that by asking. Then you want to ask people, hmm, okay, I see it's a problem for you. I see you deal with it fairly frequently. I, I see what you're doing to deal with it right now. <laughs> that seems like a pain. I'm sorry to hear that. You think it's just you or, or do you think a lot of your counterparts have the same problem? Right? Because again, it doesn't help you if you solve the problem for one person. You want to make sure that this is a prevalent problem. Now, Sometimes this is where it goes off the rails, right? Especially the first time, especially early on, you don't get the answers that you're thinking of. They don't seem to think it's such a big deal. So you've got to ask yourself, why is that? Well, it's always possible that you're talking to the wrong person, right? It may not be a problem for them because their colleague at another department deals with that at this university. Or maybe that's not his job. He gives it off to you know, one of his associates and they somehow solve it and he has no idea how painful it is for his associate. I'll give you a concrete example. One of the companies in the Dream and Accelerator program right now, a company called Pick My Kid, makes solutions for uh, handling these pick up and dismissal of kids you know, from grade school, which as you know, anyone who's done carpool will tell you, is a big pain in the butt. Principals may not know that. Principals don't usually see that. They hand it off to an associate principal to organize, assistant principal to organize, or it, it's the teachers are out there. Those 45 minutes, the principal's in his office. You may not know it. Right? It could be a real problem, but you're talking to the wrong guy. Uh, it may not be as widely uh, a problem as you thought it was. Right? You had that problem in your last job. That's why you set out to fix it. No one else seems to care. It's possible. Right? And lastly, there's always the possibility that you just didn't describe it well. It could just be a communication thing. So you want to take these back and you want to work on it and see if you can figure out which it is. After you've got about 20 or 30 of these under your belt, you pretty much eliminated a lot of these if you're doing your job right. But the first couple of times, don't be, don't be overly disappointed if the answers aren't what you expect they could be because it could be uh, technical malfunctions. Okay, root cause of the problem. A lot of people think they know what the problem is. They think they know how to solve it, but they're not going deep enough. Uh, so for those of you who, who are old enough to remember when people worried about Japan as opposed to China, uh, there was a, a chap the Japanese 
a business technique that I learned in business school. It's called the five whys. It's how do you get down to the root cause of a problem? Well, you know, for some reason, kids just aren't uh, progressing from year. They're dropping out. Well, why do you think that is? Well, they're having trouble with some of the academics. If you stop there, you're thinking, oh, well, you know, they're just stupid. I don't know. Maybe they just can't hack it. So why do you think they're struggling with the academics? It's like, well, you know, they complain they don't have enough time to study. Well, don't they have enough time to study? Well, it's because they have to have, you know, second jobs. Like, oh, why, a second job? Why is that? Well, because it's expensive to go to college. Hmm. So what you started out thinking was a... Uh, a problem with student retention is actually an affordability issue, right? But you don't get there until you dig down far enough to see what the root cause is. Now, it may not be right. I mean, you do this over and over again, and if they all end up drilling down to the right place, the same place, then you're probably there. Uh, and people can be wrong at like, what they think are the, the underlying causes of the problem. But you have to have this conversation to even get there, to even unearth these possibilities. Uh, now, I made it sound pretty easy. Well, that's good, because I made up both sides of the dialogue, so of course it should be easy. But um, it's not that hard once you get used to it. You really, all you have to do is nod. So, hmm, why do you think that is? And then just shut up for another couple of minutes and let them talk. It is that simple. It'll feel awkward, but I promise you, it gets easy. OK, so let's keep going. Let's assume that you're at the point where you've got a pain point that lots of people feel. It is massively painful. And it's frequent. And they're a great solve my problem. And you've drilled down to, yes, I am solving the root cause of the problem, so I'm on the right track. Now you want to figure out how you stack up against the potential competition. Right? So as you're describing the benefits, and by the way, you always describe the benefits, not features. You guys know the difference? Features are things like, oh, it. Uh, it has a widget. OK, I don't care. What does the widget do? The widget saves you an hour a day. That's a benefit, right? That's a horrible example, but you get the idea. But as you go down the benefits, um, you want to watch the person you're talking to. Right? If you've just unleashed the three biggest benefits of your product, and they're just, hmm, 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 uh, something's not right there. Right? Something's not right with either how you presented it or what you think is going to float their boat. Right? So you want to see what they're actually leaning forward and engaging on. Wow, it was only that third benefit that really seemed to get Darren excited. That's interesting. You also want to figure out, as you're talking about it, uh, you want to have an open ranging conversation. So when you say, oh, it does this, that, and the other thing, you want to be open. You want to invite them to say things like, oh, you know what? I'm using this system. They're horrible at that. right? Oh, okay, that's good. That's a good comparative, competitive advantage you have. Or it's like, yeah, I know what I mean, but actually this system's pretty good at doing that. So you want them to you know, go back and forth with you. See where you stack up relative to what they're using or what they've heard of. Uh, now you will come up with, with some of, well, actually, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Uh, you also want to see if you can align those benefits against how that specific person is compensated. So, in a perfect world, everyone does the right thing for the organization as a whole. And I believe most people will try to do that and will tell you they're doing that and probably believe that they're doing it. In the real world, if you know that the person you're talking to is compensated salary plus bonus and bonus is contingent on hitting these metrics, I guarantee you if you can sell against those metrics, it will be an easier sell. So see if you can understand that. No. So, how much do you make? No, wrong way to do it. But things like, what do you measure in your department? Right? How do you define success? Those are the kind of questions you want to get to and really try to bring it down to metrics. Because you know, until you can measure it, you can't really prove that you've done it. OK, uh, you'll go through, as you start describing it, you'll ask them, so how does this sound? Does it sound like something totally new, a little bit new? What's it remind you of? Right. Uh, and they'll bring up other competition. They may say it sounds like X. You may think you're nothing like X. But that's very important information. Because in the minds of the market is where you're competing, not in your mind. So if they think you're like X, you have to really understand why it is they think you're like X. 
Is it how you're presenting your, your, your solution? Or is there something about what that other solution does, even though it doesn't seem like it's the main point of that other solution, but they're attacking the same root cause in a different way. So that will come out of this conversation as well. And you're also going to get a sense overall of how compelling it is. Like again, if the guy's just kind of sitting there, okay, not very compelling. But if he's leaning forward and saying, I need this yesterday, that's what you want to do. And you can even ask him, say, Darren, it seems like this solves your problem. What am I missing? Like, what would you want if you had a wish list? What would be in this product that I haven't mentioned? Now, in a perfect world, he'll say something is one of the features you hadn't mentioned yet. And that's a major score. But almost as good, in fact, maybe even better is if he said, you know, I'll tell you, no one else does this. I wish somehow you could do this. Well, that's very useful because if no one else does this, now you have something that gives you competitive advantage over everybody in the market. So that's where this conversation should be going. Okay, I, I kind of talked ahead a little bit on this, but uh, the, people always ask me, do I bring up my competition? In these, in these discussions? The answer is yes, you always do. <coughs> Sorry, I've been fighting a cold for the past two weeks, and I'm only now starting to win. Uh, OK, so your competition, you do have to bring them up. Absolutely, especially in the feedback session. When you're in hardcore sales, you know we can argue it a different way. But for this, you absolutely have to talk about your competition, at least the big ones that people may have heard of. Because right, it's important for you to understand where you stand next to them. But as you mentioned, like the three competitors that you think you compete with, you say, so Darren, you know, those are who I think I compete with. You know, do you see me in the same, you know, solving the same problems? Right? It's not clear, without you asking, it's not clear that you're actually competing with those guys in the minds of the market. They may come back and say, I have no idea why you listed so-and-so. They're totally different. They're doing other stuff. And again, this could be because you failed to describe your product properly, or it could be because that competitor doesn't do what you think he does, or doesn't do it anymore, or does it so poorly that no one uses that module and they just don't even think. That people don't even think of that guy as being in the same space as you. It's extremely valuable to know. And then you say, okay, so who did I miss, right? Because you want to know who, in the mar who does the market consider your competitor that maybe you're not thinking of. And we talked about that a little before. Uh, this is not your time to come up with each and every three-person startup from you know, anywhere in like the southwest to the northeast. Right? Uh, you really only need to deal with kind of relatively big competitors that you have to worry about uh, that you're going to bump into regularly. It's good to know about all the upcoming competition, but don't obsess about them. They're also just trying to figure it out. But you do want to know anyone big that's in the market that might be confused with you, that you might be going up against, even if it's tangentially, you want to know who they are so that you can position against them appropriately. Okay, you can even, and believe me, you can do all this in a 45 minute meeting, you can even test your pricing. Now pricing is tough to test. If you ask somebody, Darren, would you pay $10 for this? Darren's gonna say yes. Doesn't matter why, he's gonna say yes. You know why he's gonna say yes? Doesn't want to hurt my feelings. Also, he doesn't want me to think he's cheap. Uh, that sounds flippant, but it's true. The answers you get when you ask somebody, would you pay X for something, are nearly worthless. If you ask them, hmm, I'm really glad to hear that, Darren. What, what do you think about your colleagues? Would they pay 10 bucks for that? There's no way, they're cheap bastards. Right? That's truth. <laughs> what, what they think their peers will do is closer to truth. Now, the ideal way to test anything is to put it out there. So if you're a, a business to consumer company, B2C company, and you've already got you know, some, some site visitors, you can actually A-B test stuff and get real answers to this. And that's the gold standard. But at this stage, and especially if you're an enterprise company, the best way you get it is with, with these interviews. So what you want to understand is, is okay, you know, given what I've told you about, would you switch from what you're using now? Right? Because you know, that assumes it's the same price. I mean, let's, just, let's see if they'll switch even at the same price. It's like, well, yeah, no. well that's a problem. Right? Why not? Right? What are you paying for you know, the current solution, if you don't mind my asking? Ballpark. OK. Uh, would you switch? Yeah, I'd switch. OK, great. That's your floor. If they would switch at the same price, that gives you a sense of where you can price it at. Hmm. 
how much more valuable is this, right? I mean, we have all these other features. If we were to break it out with feature A and feature B, <coughs> and if feature B were extra, would you pay for that? Oh, yeah, I absolutely have to have feature B. Well, good, you're on the track. Now, actually putting dollars out there is one of those kind of things that scares people. But do it, right? You can put down a range. I, thinking about, uh, I was thinking about charging between ten dollars and $20,000 a year for it. Hmm, we don't actually think about it that way. We always do it in, in a per student per year basis. Oh, okay. Well, that would roughly be the equivalent of 50 cents to a dollar per student per year. Right? That's the kind of conversation you want to have. You want to, you want to understand how the market is used to thinking about pricing and where the, the kind of zones of, you know, this is what we usually pay for a thing like this, and then where you stand relative to things like this. If you're a super premium product above things like this, and you're going to price above whatever that range is. But you want that to come out of this. And, and you're going to test the different ways you price it. Uh, one of the things we like to do is, is something called flinch pricing. Has anyone heard that before? So flinch pricing is a great way to raise the price on them after you've, you've mentioned it. So the idea is you want to keep raising that price until suddenly they actually like respond. So Darren says, well, what are you going to charge for it? Well, I thought we might charge $10,000. No response. That's too low. Per semester, right? Still no response. Per college. He's like, well, we have a lot of colleges. OK, well, we'll see. We have discounts for multiple colleges. I'm raising the price until I think I've hit a sore point. And then I walk it back a little. Right? That's flinch pricing. You can do that. Of all the things I've mentioned today, that's the trickiest. It takes the most practice. OK. You're not done yet. Even if you know how much you're going to charge for this, and you know for sure that it's a problem that they need to solve, you are way better than the current solutions out there, you still don't know how the sale gets done. Right? It ain't that easy. Right? If you're a B2C company, they're on the website, they click either option A, option B. It's, it's simple. Same person that makes the decision is the one that pays and the ones that benefits. Those are easy businesses. Doesn't work that way in ed tech. Doesn't work that way in health tech. So you should have a conversation with them. So, so you're interested in it. I'm not selling you now. Don't get nervous. I just want to understand how does the process work, right? Would you, be, would you um, make this decision by yourself? Is it totally within your discretionary budget? Or would you bring other people in on it? Oh, OK, you bring other people in on it. Are they to advise you, or do they need to sign off on it as well? Oh, OK, so you need to be signed off from these two departments. OK. Uh, talk me through that process. How does it work? Like, do you have meetings? Uh, oh, it's your monthly meeting. You discuss these things. Very, very interesting. Okay. Get a sense of the time frame, the process. Who has to be involved? Who signs off? Uh, whose budget is it coming out of? Right? That's critical. Right? You got to know where the checks are coming from because ultimately that's usually the people who have to make the final decision. And then also, how often are the funds budgeted? Because uh, in an ideal world, you get the contract and it's locked in for three, four years. It doesn't always work that way. But sometimes the harder it is to get the sell, the longer you've got it after. You want to understand these things, you can ask them. Nothing wrong with asking them at your, your meeting. OK, so the demo. Let's say you have a demo because you, know, you built it before you heard this talk. Or because it's the kind of business where a demo is necessary. A couple of tips here, right? Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a mock-up or an actual live demo. Focus on what the audience cares about. I can't tell you how many times startup has flipped open the laptop and they're like, I'm going to log in now. Oh my god, why couldn't you have logged in before the meeting, right? You don't need to log in. Have all the screens open in the background. Save me 20 seconds of my life. Get to the stuff that matters. So, like, oh, and this is how you change the color in the background. I don't care about that. Don't show me every feature. What are the benefits that matter to me? Show me only them. Uh, use a common use case or a series of scenarios. Right? OK, here's a situation. You've got a student on the verge of, of failing uh, chemistry. And if he fails chemistry, he's going to lose his loans. He'll probably have to drop out. OK, I got the scenario. What happens? Well, this is how we figure out that that's happening. And here's how we address it. Great. Talk me through that scenario. Only that scenario. And they can tell me one or two more scenarios. That's fine but be laser focused on, on the parts of it that matter. And ignore the stuff that doesn't. Uh, one of the things that people will do sometimes that drives me a little nuts, and I always have to ask, is 
the user does X. I don't know who the user is, right? If it's a teacher or a professor, say it's a teacher. If it's a student, say it's a student. Make sure I know who's doing what. You can end up burning like minutes of time and you got this guy giving these blank stares like, I, I don't know what you're talking about because you haven't even told them who's doing what. So be very, very clear on who, you know, who you're referring to at any one point in the process. Uh, and again, just do not try to show everything. That's not the point here. Uh, you're really just trying to get to the important stuff and get their reaction to it. Okay, we're almost done. Deep breaths. Before you leave, there are a couple of things you absolutely want to remember to do. So number one, so Darren, who else should I be talking to about this? You know, either at Penn State or other universities you know, right? Always get more referrals that way. Number two, um, really, really useful. I appreciate it. Can I come back to you in a month after I've had more of these meetings and let you know what I've learned? Right? Establish their appetite for follow-up. It's like, no, I'm away for the next month, two months. Okay, fine, I'll call you again in two months, right? Uh, I really appreciate your time, Darren. What can I do totally separate from this meeting that makes your life easier, right? Now, most people forget to offer that. Simply being willing to repay them in some way will make you stand out and make them more willing to, you know, to actually take your meeting again. If they say something, do it, right? Or try to do it, or at least say, okay, I know you're looking to hire somebody for that position, no one jumps to mind right away, I will absolutely keep it in mind. And even if it doesn't, at least you kept it in mind, right? And you can even send an email two or three weeks later, Darren, hey, I've been looking, I haven't found anyone yet, but I'm still looking. <clears throat> at least let them know you're trying. It'll set you apart from 99% of the other people who have stolen 45 minutes of their life. Uh, and, you know, next steps, if there are any, obviously make them clear. Okay, I'm going to get all your feedback. Uh, I have some more, if there were mock-ups, I may send you some more mock-ups later just for the stuff that we didn't have here today, if that's all right with you. And thank them. Very, very simple, thank them. Most people remember the thank you, though. Okay. Uh, B2C companies often ask me about surveys, right? Because, hey, it's really, really hard to go out there and talk to 30 customers. Can I just get a survey? So the answer is uh, no. This is not a substitute for talking to people. You still do your 20 or 30 Interviews face-to-face -face because you get the most bandwidth. Where surveys come in is when you want to drill down on specifics or if you want kind of statistically meaningful distinctions. So after you've had your 20 or 30 meetings, if you're a B2C company, go out there. You want to run your surveys on things like, you know, is this price point better than that price point? I would say just test it. That's the best type of survey. But that's surveys place. They do not take the place of one-on-one -on -one interviews whether they're uh, the provost of the university or a mom-facing app. You still have to talk to the people who are actually going to use, decide to purchase, and pay for your product. Um, okay, just some general advice here. I've given you a very step-by-step -step approach. You've got to be flexible. Right? If the guy wants to talk about, he wants to jump straight into the demo, he doesn't want to talk about backgrounds and roles, go with it, right? If he wants to go off on a, a tangent about other stuff that pisses him off that has nothing to do with what you're doing, let him. But casually bring him back, right? <coughs> what you want to get out of this is kind of like a checklist. It doesn't matter to you what order you get the things done in. It doesn't matter whether it takes you 10 minutes at the end to figure out the last three quarters of it, as long as you get it done. So be flexible. Don't force it into a particular pattern, but be politely relentless about getting back to the things that matter because you don't want to leave that room with these questions unanswered. Key takeaways, right? I told you I was going to tell you what I was going to tell you. I told you, and I'm going to tell you again. Sorry. Um, you meet them in person, early and often. You want to test your positioning right away. Problem, is it painful? Is it frequent? Is it widespread? Right? My benefits, are they compelling to you? Are they different from what's out there? Competitors, am I looking at the right people? Are there people that I'm missing? Right? Be flexible and get referrals. OK, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, by the way, I should have told you this earlier on, you don't need to take notes. I will send you this deck if you want it. Uh, that 
goes for the studio audience as well, uh, the uh, remote audience as well. My email is andrew at dreamit.com. Just say, I'd love the uh, customer feedback deck, and I'll send it to you. OK, questions? Anyone on the feedback deck or on the presentations prior to me? Complexities of um, international collaboration. And so you might have um, uh, a US company. You might have a couple of entities in Sweden. Uh, and you might have a university. Um, so it uh, so might not be a bulk, an obvious template for how to do that, but there, you might have some stuff that people could look at to refer to how it's been done successfully before. So the flip answer is uh, I did that twice on the car ride in today. Uh, I actually did have to deal with uh, companies applying to Dreamit talking about how they wanted to, uh, whether or not they wanted to become Delaware C Corps or not. But I don't think that's your answer, your question. I think your question is more about when you're dealing with uh, a company that spans uh, educational systems in different countries. Is that, where you're, is that what you're asking about? Well, that, that makes products that are used in different, com uh, different places, um, different countries, um, and is interested in expanding the use of those and m making partnerships with people who know a lot about of education and about research and education. And so is it so complicated that it's smart just to not even try to do it in collaboration with Penn State, for example? So. I'll let you guys speak for Penn State itself. Uh, very often, so first of all, Dream and Startups come from all the way around the world. And we actually, you know, kidding aside, dealt with this last week at a conference of Nordic ed tech startups that had come to New York. I'm based out of New York for what it's worth. Uh, and the question always becomes, uh, whether it's an ed tech company or a digital health company, is the solution portable? Which always, when you think about it, the question is actually, is the pain point the same? Right, so is the, do we have the same problems here as there? So in ed tech, uh, there are a lot of things that can trip it up. So number one, we have a different educational system, both at the higher ed and at the K-12 level. Number two, uh, in the K-12 level, for instance, their teachers are very highly compensated professionals. So the way they interact with uh, you know, product and the way they are, the receptivity they are to uh, new ideas is very, very different. Uh, on the health side, for instance, a lot of the ideas that come over, it could be a life-saving product, but if nobody in our system actually profits from it, they don't get adopted. Right? So you might have a great solution, but if the insurer doesn't save money or if the care provider isn't able to bill for it, it doesn't get traction. So I don't mean to make it sound very bleak, but usually there's a process where uh, you need somebody in the market that you're thinking to, that you are going to penetrate, uh, who understands those market dynamics in and out, and will either be a shortcut for what I just talked about, because he understands the customers that well, or you go through that process yourself to educate yourself. But the illusion that it worked great in Norway, so it's going to work in New York, that has killed a lot of businesses. So did you want to? I'll just say uh, real quickly, we get approached by, um, many different companies, uh, ed tech companies from other countries. Typically what I've seen is these other companies, say, say a company that comes from Australia, they'll actually set up an entity here in the U.S. to then deal with and work with uh, universities, colleges, et cetera, here in the U.S. So they're solving that problem in order to get to, to this market. At least that's what I've seen. Yeah, and, and speaking to, um, I think, Penn State's appetite to work with you to kind of solve some of those complexities, because they can be, right? The university owns intellectual property. Faculty member may have a uh, related intellectual property that's their own, developed outside of the scope of their work. Um, there's a, an office, the Office of Technology Management, uh, that's uh, inside of the research office that I think is um, aware of the fact that there's this, this general uh, push inside and outside of universities to be more deliberate about moving this stuff out into the world. So I think you'll sense that as you start talking to them. So if you've got a very specific issue, you're like, man, this is complicated. We've got part of the solution is owned here, part of the solution is here, part of it is mine. I've got to figure out how that all works. 
The, the university has dedicated resources to help you navigate through that. And then if it turns out, the university also will um, give what they say is a get out of jail free card, which basically means we have no intention of ever doing anything with this intellectual property. So it's all yours and you can, you can work through it. And that's where something like the uh, entrepreneurship assistance clinic that provides assistance at, at no cost is very useful. And for example, we actually have a startup company uh, operating out of Happy Valley Launchbox that is a half German company, half US company. They just won a large award in Germany. Their operational team is based in State College, Colorado and uh, Berlin. And so they're working through where they should um, set up their legal entities, ownership, distribution, partnership agreements, all of that, but, but it's working, right? So there, there are mechanisms there. So, uh, and we're happy to be part of the, the, the dialogue to get you tagged to the right resources. Cool. Um, I, what's it in it? What does Penn State get by encouraging this? Um, I can understand that we want to help the students provide the incubation opportunities for students so they'll come to attract students. What about staff and faculty? We hope the faculty start their own company and they leave. So what's it in? for Penn State. Darren, you want to? So, so the, let me just address that last point. So you said, so the uh, faculty or staff, that, that they start a company and then they leave. So what we're trying to do here with, in conjunction with Invent Penn State is actually to create an e ecosystem so they don't have the incentive to leave. That, that State College actually becomes and, 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 and we're getting there as evidenced by the, the statistic that, that James showed that we're in, in the top 10 of uh, cities across the country in terms of entrepreneurship. But we're, we're building an ecosystem that encourages them to stay here because we're giving them the resources um, at a very low cost or in some cases free to help them uh, establish their business. Now at some point a company may decide, hey, I'm, I'm outgrowing State College and I need to go somewhere else. And that's totally understandable, but I will say at the same time, uh, take a company, uh, um, I knew I'd forget it as soon as I started talking about it. Uh, what's the ed tech company in town that just got bought by Blackboard? School Wires. My memory is terrible. Uh, but, but School Wires grew a huge company here that was ed tech based and, and, and uh, last year got bought by Blackboard. So a tremendous success. So it's proof that you can grow a company here, that we do have the resources. Um, so the idea is to, is to keep them to stay. So how does it, invent, how does it uh, impact Penn State, State College? It goes back to Dr. Barron's initiative of how can we take what we know to, to help these companies grow and stay here and spur economic development? Because we're trying to, to help the economy grow beyond Penn State so it's not just a, quote, company, company town. So it's right. Can I add, a, there's, there's a, a misconception here, I think, uh, that a a faculty person or on the health tech side, a doctor, they're going to have an idea, they're going to run with it, and they're going to leave. The far more uh, prevalent situation is they have an idea, they don't do anything about it, it dies. Right? In many, many cases, uh, you know, faculty members might have a fantastic idea, but by temperament and preference, they'd rather be faculty members. And they'd like to see it come to earth, but they know they don't have those skill sets. Or if they would like to do it, they know that they need other people on their team. So part of what Penn State is doing, and I hope we're helping you with it, is to create an environment where those ideas can be nurtured. And if the faculty member doesn't want to run with it and just wants to be the advisor who birthed it and hopefully profit from it somehow, instead of it dying stillborn, it actually gets a chance to become a company that spreads its wing, flies, and profits. Uh, if the faculty member wants to be part of it and to continue to run with it, he or she gets the rest of the team around him or her, and the rest of the resources, and the rest of the knowledge to actually make that more likely to succeed. Yeah, I, agreeing 100%. There's nothing implicit about anything we've said that says that um, the university is looking to take its faculty, staff, and students and have them be CEOs. It's about, in most cases, a partnership in between someone with an inventive mind and an entrepreneur, they get together 
be part of a team that would take something to market. So as an example, um, the company I was with uh, was founded by a distinguished faculty member in uh, engineering science. So I had you know, been around for a while, moved back to State College temporarily, and ended up um, being the first external hire as they were looking to go from uh, more or less a platform technology inside of the university to something that was very early stage but outside of the university. So it was not, and at no point did that faculty member ever become an employee of the company, right? And the same holds true for staff, and there are examples of that at the university as well. So understanding what the market wants will help you in your development and looking at the technology, but I don't think we want to set an expectation that everything here is kind of teed up to try to get folks to leave. If that happens, and that's what, what is uh, really driving the individual in the long term, everyone's going to be better, right? Because that individual will have realized their dream, and the university will have an example of someone who made a real impact in society, and very likely will come back at some at some point. And so, um, because there was a startup company that was founded here in State College, so my family stayed here, and now I'm back at the university, uh, and so it cycles back through. But um, you know, th there's nothing about all this that says we're, we're trying to get our faculty and staff to be CEOs because that's not, not the case. There are going to be examples where it's the right fit, but more often than not, it's going to be through a partnership that that translation occurs. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, we have a couple questions on uh, online. Jerry online, uh, well, let me frame this first. So a, a number of great resources have been, uh, have been uh, uh, detailed here between the launch box, Dream It, uh, and and others and the Invent Penn State and Ed Tech Network and overall. The question they had online though is, is Jerry in particular had, is what's the doorway? So I've got an idea, I've got all these great resources, but maybe I'm not going to be part of this Launchbox cohort. What's the doorway that I walk through? And if I'm outside of Penn State, is there a way for me to enter through that doorway as well as an individual with an idea or a, or a startup company outside of Penn State? Can I just link up with a faculty member, and then that can and can provide me some access uh, to these resources? Uh, how how can that all work? Well, with with Launchbox in particular, it is open to anyone. You do not have to have any type of Penn State affiliation whatsoever to have access to the legal resources, the ten week boot camp, the twenty four hour office space. All of that is available to anyone. And I know a number of the other uh, innovation hubs around the Commonwealth. I'm not sure where, where Jerry's located, um, but a lot of them have the same uh, very low barrier to entry. Um, you know, what the doorway looks like, I think, <clears throat> depends on where you are, which stage you're at. Right? If, you're, if you're a fully formed company, then you probably need to, to uh, be with Andrew directly. Uh, if it's really just an idea, you may need um, some additional funds uh, to, to drive your project uh, ahead. But you know, certainly, as, as Andrew pointed out, you can start talking to people right away. Uh, and certainly, you know, Launchbox, you can walk in anytime, 9 to 5, and immediately get triaged, is what we call it. We have a, pro a formal process called triage that helps you get routed to the right resource. Great. We also have a, a question from, uh, from Faria online. She asks, is it always advisable to start with a problem rather than a need or desire to bring about an innovation? Uh, problems are chronologically based in the present versus desire that's timed for the future. And she gives a scenario. An international grad student wants to commercialize an idea, but doesn't know if they'd be staying in the USA after graduation. What advice would you have for them? OK, so I mean, part of this is semantics. The difference between a need and a problem, you're basically stating uh, the same thing, is that uh, someone out there has to feel pain enough that they're willing to give you money to relieve that pain. Uh, the scenario that you had is, I presume it's, it's for yourself. She has a, an idea for a business she'd like to start, but it's unclear to her whether or not she wants to do it here in the States or back home. Uh, well, first step is to make sure your idea actually resolves a pain point. Go out there, you can talk to customers right now. Right? That's a great way to figure out if you even have anything to worry about. Now, the caveat I'll put on it is, if you may be doing this in a different country, the pain point may be different. It may not be as intense, may not be felt the same way. But 
I'm all for doing it now. Because after all, if she finds that there is a pain point and it's intense and it's frequent uh, and there's a willingness to pay and she can get a co-founder to fill in if she's non-technical, technical co-founder or vice versa, and you can actually start working on it and you start getting traction and by the grace of God, you actually have a business that people will pay you money, then why would you leave? The decision's made for you. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions of the room? Jeff's coming behind you there. Um, my question is more on a teaching learning perspective. Uh, I don't know how it regards to that, uh, what you are doing. But uh, in any case, um, uh, I want to know just, uh, do, do you have any uh, research or uh, and did analyze that uh, about, uh, regarding the faculty members when they are involved in an uh, entrepreneurship job or uh, activities? Do they uh, lack in their teaching, or they are they are doing better than um, the other faculty members who are not uh, who are not involved on that pro, um, process? And also, uh, do you have any analysis that the students which are coming to you with their ideas, if they are uh, um, involved in any project with those faculty members who are also uh, involved, or the students which uh, do not do any project, just uh, comparing that uh, if this faculty member's job in the entrepreneurship um, is reflecting on the students also. Um, That's a great question. It, it, it's a very good question. And to be honest, uh, the, um, there's not a lot of data specifically looking at kind of academic outcomes and then tracking those against entrepreneurial. There are entire institutions, um, and, and uh, I think we know that the, you know, the MITs and, and whatnot, where it's quite clear, I mean, the mentality there is when are you going to start your startup company, right? Not, you know, you have one, well, that's going to pull away your time from uh, your, your other responsibilities. So culturally, there are institutions that uh, I think show that there is uh, no conflict in between excellence in your teaching, your research, and, and in, in some cases it's, it's actually quite easy to make an argument that all of those things relate fairly nicely because you're now understanding things like things that are external to the university that may filter back and help with education, teaching, research. So having a deeper connectivity to root problems and, and some of the complex systems that are on the receiving end of the research I think could be beneficial. Um, with students, the only thing we know is that we, we can't produce enough students that have backgrounds in, uh, around entrepreneurship from the viewpoint of uh, industry that's coming here to hire because they've demonstrated a level of problem solving that is hugely valuable and, and they've done something extracurricular because they have drive. And if you have anything, if you've done anything extracurricular and you're very driven that's a great marker whenever you're looking for, for a recruit. Now, a lot of these fa and a lot of the students rather, you know, they're ambivalent about whether or not I want to go and work for you know, one of the large consulting companies because they've developed something on their own and they, they're really uh, engaged in that process of managing it and growing it. So it does. I'm not going to say it doesn't create conflict. It, it can. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. There's a company right now that's in Launchbox and the two founders both had Wall Street jobs and they turned it down and, and they're basically you know, living on $8,000 a year for, the, for this year as they're starting their startup company. But you know what? They're recent graduates. They never got a taste for, for anything above ramen noodles. So it's a great time to do it. And they're doing great things. So um, I don't think that there's an inherent conflict there. Um, but it's something that we need to be mindful of. And I 100% agree that we should look to be more data driven on that. So I am biased, uh, clearly. Uh, I would love to see if there's data between teaching effectiveness and an instructor's entrepreneurial experience. I would love to actually see where uh, the whole idea of a sabbatical becomes the year they take off to start a business. But I may be a little ambitious on that. Uh, while there's no data on it, I would point out on the student side at least, a lot of the experiences that you get when you start a business map onto a lot of qualities that there have been studies of resilience, being self-motivated, 
uh, being able to prioritize under time constraints. All of these things, there have been stu delayed gratification, of course. All of these things, there have been studies of. Uh, so to the extent that those qualities uh, are causative and rather, rather than just correlative, uh, and to the extent that you can teach them through an entrepreneurship program, they should be providing uh, uh, positive outcomes. So we're unfortunately out of time now. So I was hoping that I can ask everyone to help me in thanking James, Darren, and Andrew for being with us today. And thank each of you in person and online for being here. Uh, this recording will be up next week as well as slides if you're interested. Thanks for joining us.